turn it up because the Lord is burning. Father, Lord, as we look into your word once again, Father, I pray, Lord, that you would speak the message, Lord, that you would have to be spoken. Lord, I pray that hearts and minds would receive that that you have for them to receive, Lord, that we could apply it to our lives, that we could ever become more of that that you would have us to be. Lord, just take this flesh and use it, I pray, for your purpose, for your will, for your honor, for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Book of Romans, chapter 8, we're going to be breaking in at verse 12. We talked a little bit last week about walking in the Spirit, and this goes along with that a little bit. Romans chapter 8, verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. And I'm going to just be going through here and reading and stopping and reading and stopping. There's a lot of points I need to make. Um, the, the scripture that we're reading here, Paul is talking about, he talks about when uh, Christ is in you, that the body is dead, but the spirit is alive. This is the previous scripture before where we break in. And that's uh, the theme that he's on when he gets to this point. And he says, therefore, we are debtors. What is a debtor? It is somebody that owes something. It is somebody uh, that is responsible to pay or to repay something. Uh, there's a negative balance on your account or whatever that is. And he says, we are debtors. But we are not debtors to the flesh. We don't owe anything to the flesh. We are not uh, under any obligation to the flesh. He says that we are debtors, but we are uh, not to the flesh to live after the flesh. Because if we live after the flesh, if we make the flesh uh, what we are obligated to, or if we make the flesh what we're trying to uh, settle an account with, or pay to, or however you want to term that, if we do that, then we are going to die. And I don't mean you're going to physically cease to exist. You're going to drop over. But spiritually speaking, speaking, you are going to die. If the flesh becomes what's important to you, and the flesh becomes what you cater to, and the flesh becomes what you uh, focus your attention and your effort and your strength and everything on, then spiritually you are going to die. Because he says, if you live after the flesh, you are going to die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. If you through the Spirit do put to death the deeds of the body, then spiritually you shall live. And the deeds of the body are not just acts if you go back and you look at the original, if you go back and look at what it says, it's the, it's the actions, it's the wants, it's the desires, it's the motivation, it's the influence of the flesh. These are the things that have to be put to death in order for the spirit to take precedence, in order for the spirit to rise up, in order for the spirit to be in charge. We have to put those things down. And we talked a little bit last Sunday night, uh, for those of you who weren't here, uh, we talked about walking in the spirit. And what is it to walk in the spirit? It's to let the spirit have control. That's what it is. And we, we made this point. It's a choice that you make. When the flesh rises up or when a choice or a decision comes, you've got to make a choice. You've got to make a decision. It's not just automatically going to happen. God's not going to yank you around. God's not going to play you like a puppet. God's not going to force you to do anything. You have to make that choice and you have to make that decision to put the flesh down so that the spirit can rise up. If you make the choice and you make the decision to put the flesh down, the spirit will become stronger and the spirit will become more in control and the spirit will guide more. And if we do that, then we can live. Then we can really live. I know we live now because we are born again. We are children of God. But I'm going to tell you, this is my opinion. And I can't give you chapter and verse. I don't think we've lived yet. I don't think we've really lived yet. I read this word and there is so much more to God than I have experienced. There is so much more to the Christian life than I have experienced. I can't speak for all of you, but the things that they did, the things they experienced, the things they saw, uh, the communication and the contact and the intimacy that they had with God is so much more than I have experienced. And I know I say this a lot, but why is that? He's the same God. The problem has to lie here. And it lies in the flesh. It lies in the Adam nature. It lies in the sinful man. 
and catering to that and getting wrong ideas and following those wrong ideas. And I know I said this last week, but I've got to say it again. Over the last however long, the church has gotten to the point where the church has been led to the belief that if you are a Christian, then that's what you should expect. Natural things, physical things, material things. That's not what you're to be after. That's what he's talking about. You need to put to death the things of the flesh. I'm not telling you God won't give you those things. He may well bless you with those things, give you those things. Well, whatever, I don't know. But that's not what you're supposed to be pursuing. That's not what you're supposed to be after. You're supposed to be after the things of the Spirit. And then if God will say those things on, he will. But if he does not, you should be still joyful and happy and content and worshiping God because you have the things of the Spirit. Those are the things that matter. Those are the things that make life. Those are the things that give life. Those are the things that will enable you to live, really live. And again, I don't think we've lived yet. We think because we have things, we think because uh, things are going well and smooth and easy that we're living. That's not living. You're not living till you're living in the Spirit. Listen, he goes on, he says, If you put to death the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Listen, he said it, I didn't say it, I'm reading you what the Bible says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God, or the daughters. I, I say this often, but I want you to get it. If something is unequivocally true, then the opposite is also unequivocally true. Those that are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. So opposite of that is, if you are not led by the Spirit of God, you are not a son or a daughter of God. We need to read the Bible and understand the Bible for what it's saying. Not go on what we've been... Uh, told all of our lives and taught all of our lives and what's been precepts, what the Word says is what matters. What the Word says, and the Word says, if you're led by the Spirit of God, you're a child of God. So opposite. If you're not led by the Spirit of God, you're not a child of God. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. I, I want to make a couple points here. First, you have to be led by the Spirit of God to be a child of God. That's the word. You have to be led by the Spirit. And, I, and you answer this for yourself. How many of you are really led by the Spirit? Or are you led by what mom and dad taught you growing up? Or the church you used to go to taught you when you went there? What that preacher said. Are you led by that or are you led by the Spirit of God? We have to be led by the Spirit of God to be a child of God. Because we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption. We have been brought into something. We have been brought into the family of God. We can't be the children of God unless we're brought in to the family of God, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. I've heard a lot of different definitions for that word, Abba. A lot of people say it's Daddy or Dad or something like that. I, actually, what it is, if you go back into the original, it's an Aramaic form of the word Father. But it is a form that is only used by the close family. It is only used by those who are intimate with that person. So what he's saying here, it's an intimate word. Nobody else can use that word but those who are intimate with that one. So we are brought into this family by adoption and we can cry intimately Father. Father. That's what he's saying. But listen, it's intimate. And again, you answer this for yourself. How many of you are as intimate with God as you are with your child? How many of you are as intimate with God as you are with your spouse? Do we understand? He wants an intimate relationship, a close relationship, a loving relationship. He wants a relationship that, that is intertwined one with another. When you talk about an intimate relationship with someone, you know them inside and out. They know you inside and out. How many of us are like that with God? Really, how many of us are like that 
with God. I'm going to tell you, and, and you may not physically or, or intentionally sit down and think these thoughts or say these words, but I'm going to tell you from my own experience and from watching people, we live the Christian life by a set of guidelines. That's what we do. We're not that intimate with God that where we hear the Spirit guide us and lead us. We've got our set of rules. We've got our set of guidelines. We've got what we've been taught or what we think, and that's how we live. Back to where I started and back to some of last week. Every situation, every circumstance, every choice should be dictated by the Spirit of God. Not by this list that I already have. This is how we do this. This is how we do that. This is how we do this. This is how we do that. It should be by the... And I'm saying everyone. You might not think they're no big deal. But every area of your life is a concern to God. If you are intimate with someone, you're concerned about everything in their life. You want everything to go good. You want everything to go smooth. You care about their, their mental state, their emotional state, their spiritual state, their, their well-being, their physical growth. Everything you care about, and so does God. You can't get any more intimate than God gets. And he cares about everything. So every choice, every decision you should make uh, being led by the Spirit. And no, not every choice that comes up. You've got to go and pray for an hour to get the answer. Because if you're intimate, he's already right there. And he's already given you the advice. But you're not hearing it. Because you're not intimate enough. We have to get that in love with God. And I'm going to tell you something. And you can believe me or you cannot believe me. Your life would be so much better. Your life would go so much smoother. You would suffer a whole lot less. You would have a whole lot less troubles and trials. And worries and anxiety. If you would learn to do that. He says. We have that adoption. We've been adopted into the family of God. But it's got to be intimate. He said that hey, when we get into that family of God, in that intimate relationship, then we can use the intimate form of God. We can get close. We, we can be uh, just like that parent that you're so close to, that, that you can climb up on their lap. When you got a little boo-boo, they're just going to pet you and pat you and, and kiss it and make it all better. And you're just so comfortable around them and you feel so safe and you feel so secure and you know that they care about every little thing about you. How many of you think about God like that? We don't. We might say, say we do, but we don't. We've got to get to this place, and that's only going to happen through the Spirit. And it's only going to happen through the Spirit when you make a choice and you make a decision to put the flesh down. That's the only way it's going to happen. You have got to mortify the flesh. You have got to die to the things of the flesh. You have got to put to death the things of the flesh. And then we can get to this point. He said, you receive the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, have a father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified. Look, if we get to that intimate place, into that family, and we are the children of God, the Spirit that indwells us, the Holy Spirit of God, is going to bear witness that we are the children of God. That's going to bear witness, and it's going to bear witness to the extent that you know. I mean, you know, there is no doubt that you are an heir, an heir of God, and a joint heir with Christ. What is an heir? It is one who receives all the stuff. He gets the property. He gets the goods. He gets the, everything that, that there is. And that's yours. God, and I'm going to tell you something. It ain't heaven someday. I know I say that a lot. The things of God are yours as long as you're on this earth too. It gets better there and you get the fullness of it there. But the things of God are yours now and you are an heir so you can have it. It belongs to you. Listen, you all know the parable of the prodigal son where the prodigal took his part and he went off. But I want you to think about the older son. What did the father say to him? Son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. Now will be yours. Is yours. It's the same with God. You are an heir. You are a joint heir with Christ. You get everything that Christ gets. Now. Not someday. Now. You are an heir. Just like back to that uh, parable of the prodigal. The man said to him, you are I here. You have always been here and everything that's mine is yours. The things of God 
are yours now. You got to get to that point where you realize that, that you understand that these things are yours and you can claim them and you can operate in them and you can live in them. You can walk in them. You can overcome situation, circumstance, problem through these things that belong to you because you are a joint heir with Christ. You get everything that Christ gets. When Christ walked this earth and everything that he faced, he was victorious over it by the things that God had endued him with. And you have the very same thing. So you can be victorious over anything. we got to get that in. It's time to quit talking it and start living it. We need to get up, rise up to that position that we've been granted. I'm going to tell you something. If I go and I get a job and they make me supervisor over a hundred men and uh, that's my position and that's my job, I'm not going out there and be the one that digs the ditch. Because I have a position that doesn't require me to do that. I have a position that puts me above that. I puts me, gives me a position where I don't have to do those kind of things. It's the same thing with God. You are in a position where you don't have to live in misery. You don't have to live in anxiety. You don't have to live in depression. You don't have to go through half the stuff you go through. You've got a position that puts you above that. But you've got to claim it. You've got to believe it. You've got to walk in it. You've got to live it. And the only way you're ever going to do that is by walking in the Spirit, by letting the Spirit lead you and have control and guide you and make the choices and the decisions. That's the only way that you're going to do it. We're going to jump over to verse 26. Now remember, this whole chapter goes together. We just don't have time to get into all of it here. There's a few things I want to bring out. This all goes together. If the Spirit indwells you, and you are intimate in that family, you are an heir and you have all these things. But not only that, verse 26, likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, which just means our weaknesses. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. Anybody been there? Mm -hmm. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now listen, there's a lot of time I don't know what to pray for. I don't know what direction to go. I don't even know how to approach uh, the situation or the circumstance or whatever. Uh, but listen, when that Spirit begins to search your heart, you know what he's praying on your behalf to God? The very depths of who you are goes to God through the Spirit of God. Listen, I'm going to slow down on this. We know not what we should pray for as we are, but the Spirit itself make an intercession for us. But that only happens if you're led by the Spirit. If you let the Spirit have control, if you let the Spirit lead, if you do that, the Spirit will make intercession. And he that searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. The Bible says, if you ask anything according to my will, I will grant it. A lot of times we don't know the will of God. But the Spirit does. And the Spirit will pray on your behalf. What does it say? According to the will of God. But that only happens when the Spirit is in control. When the Spirit is leading. When the Spirit is making the choices when the Spirit is making the decision. If we get to that point where we're led by the Spirit and we're guided by the Spirit, then when we go to pray, the Spirit will pray on our behalf, make intercession for us, and go to God and not only will make intercession for us, He will make intercession according to the will of God and according to the word that anything we ask, according to the will of God, He will grant it. So whatever problem, whatever issue, whatever circumstance, whatever situation, if you can get to this point where you're led by the Spirit, the Bible says God will answer the prayer. And he goes on. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the call according to his purpose. We know that all things, I've quoted that and quoted that and quoted that, Probably a lot of you have too. But you've got to tie it in with everything else that's been said. 
when you're led by the Spirit, when you walk in the Spirit, when the Spirit is in control, when the Spirit is making intercession, then we know that all things work 